And thank you, community, who continue to join us globally as we engage in conversation and witnessing arts centering Palestine. You are currently witnessing session 11 of our 24 Hours for Palestine. My name is AJ Antony Marquis, and I am deeply honored as a theater maker and a scholar from the pain and resilience of the African diaspora, living on the unceded lands of the Tochino speaking Ohlone people, now called Oakland, California, to have been asked to hold the space as we set the scene for our next offering, There is a Field. I am joined by Jen Marlowe, James Klin, and Anissa Mahmoud to discuss this documentary and its importance in the conversation for Palestine, liberation, and intersections with Black liberation movements in the States. Hello, you all. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here um, and for offering us this film, this documentary, There's a Field. Um, Jen, I would love to start with you, the conversation with you a bit, to discuss the project and how you became involved with this work and with um, this, this role. Thanks, AJ. It's such a, um, such a privilege to get to be with all of you um, here this evening. Um, the There is a Field um, is a play about a Palestinian teenager, 17-year-old uh, named Asil Asle, um, who was murdered by Israeli police in October 2000. Um, and Asil had been my camper. I knew him personally. Mm -hmm. So when he was murdered, it was it was um, it was very much uh, something that I wanted to figure out how I could make some kind of response to and a response that would resonate um, wider than me or wider than the circle of people who knew and loved a seal. And I came from a theater background. So the, the idea of, of, of a play um, felt like a, a, a way to respond that I had some tools for. And I instinctively felt that it should be a documentary play. I don't even think I knew the language about documentary play at that time, but I, I instinctively knew that I wanted to be, it needed to be based on a seal's own words, his own writings, his family's own own words. So I began a process of partnering with his family, particularly his older sister, Nardine, uh, which turned out to be a, a process of 15 years um, of interviews um, and and her offering me the the um, the testimonies and the and the documents that was needed to build the play. While we were putting together um uh, a, a draft of the script preparing for a university tour. It was the summer of 2014, um, and I was doing rewrites of the play, and that was the summer, of course, that that Michael Brown was murdered in Ferguson. Um, so for me, those parallels felt so visceral. I was diving into the script, um, doing rewrites about um, my 17-year-old friend who had been executed by Israeli police, and then I'm watching on the news um, the Ferguson uprising in response to um, the police murder of Michael Brown. And that's how uh, the spark grew of thinking about how a seal story through the play, through There is a Field, could be a platform to um, connect people uh, across the globe in, in liberation struggles that, that had similar underpinnings. Great. Thank you so much, Jen. And James, you are a part of this documentary, correct? I am. Yes. And I, I would love I would love to hear more about um, you know, <laughs> what motivated you to join this project. Um, what was your conversation and collaboration with Jen and as you mm -hmm. started working on this project? And um, can you discuss a little bit about your experience with the subject matter in the film as well? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, what motivated me to be a part of the project was uh, everything Jen just said, the correlation between what's been happening here in, in the States and what took place and what has been taking place in Palestine. Um, being here in, in the creative uh, community organizing spaces in Miami and learning so much about what's taking place in uh, Palestine through organizations like the Dream Defenders is how I got educated. So when I was asked to be a part of the project, for me, it was a no brainer. It just made sense because uh, we're not free until we're all free, you know? Um, and my my collaboration and involvement with, with Jen was um, her being a director and her being a writer and her being in a, in a leadership position and 
and making sure that we all felt comfortable and we understood what uh, what the scenes were about, what the play was about, and ultimately what the story was about and giving us the direction that we needed in the space to be vulnerable. Um, so that's, that's, that was how my involvement and that was my, my partnership with, with Jen. Thank you so much. And just thinking a little bit more about this kind of setting the space to be vulnerable in, in the rehearsal room and in the process, um, I would love to hear maybe from Jen what some of your process was where as you were inviting these communities together, communities that had experienced so much um, historical violence um, by state state sanctioned violence, and how you hope to hold that space as we're as they're talking about vulnerability, about uh, pain, about about um, about grief, and about maybe resilience in this fight for global liberation. How did you hold that space? And what were some of those conversations you had with your actors in those moments? And this is a surprise question. So, uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, I, I love that question. And also, uh, you know, Nisa, who's been a part of uh, facilitating uh, workshops around the play might also have things to, to jump in with that. But, you know, I think I've always found um, that theater is, uh, as an art form, has so many tools that really are um, rooted in community building and rooting in, in creating a space um, where folks can... Um, can be vulnerable with each other. And theater invites us to engage um, our bodies, our voices, and our imagination. So we really leaned a lot on theatrical tools. And we borrowed from, I wouldn't say that the workshops we did were theater of the oppressed workshops, but mm -hmm. we certainly borrowed from BOA. We borrowed from theater of the oppressed um, methodology. Uh, um, but a lot of the, a lot of the creating the container had to do with, first of all, really, really creating a solid sense of community um, with the group. And then in that community, um, both the learning about Palestine and then the engaging in the, in the script itself, both of those components serve to inform each other in ways that deepen the experience. And we did a lot of work, like embodied work. Um, and there was a whole, like, an entire day that we spent actually doing work where folks would um were exploring the four eyes of oppression right like like looking at um you know interpersonal institution ideological and uh, internal oppression thinking about what were scenes in the play that represented those four eyes embodying those scenes with um using tableaus physical sculptures and then thinking about how did those sculptures remind folks um of examples from their own lived experiences here on Turtle Island, so then um, switching to having um, those tableaus, but then also inviting the other folks in the group to think about, all right, how might we transform these tableaus from tableaus um, that were that were portraying oppression to um, resistance um, and then to liberation, right? So so and so again, it was like all interconnected with the with the conversations with the you know with the story with folks own uh, lived experiences and of course always with this eye towards how how does connecting these oppressions get us closer to liberation absolutely thank you yeah anisa do you want to speak a little bit about your experience in that work as well so i was incredibly honored that jen asked me to be a part of the workshop i think this film play documentary is really incredible and special and i think specifically for students kind of walking them through that process of connecting how our liberation movements are connected our oppression is connected and the exact same state that is oppressing palestinians is the exact same that is oppressing black americans today and really just watching students being able to kind of come to those conclusions as they're also watching the film and seeing how these activists are also making those exact same conclusions. And it's incredibly interactive, specifically with the workshop. They are, again, creating these tableaus and moving their bodies. And you're seeing them experience also this grief in real time. And the stories that come from this, from not only the activists, but also within the play, so I think just being able to see, again, these students with how interactive it is and they're moving their bodies, it makes them think about it differently. 
Yes, thank you so much, Anissa, for sharing that. And everyone so far has already hinted um, at these kind of relationships between um, state violence and state sanction violence and liberation movements kind of globally. But I'm wondering if we can really um, zoom in more specifically to the relationship you all are finding between um, Zionist ideologies that are that are arising, um, that has been arising, and kind of like racial and white supremacy and racial ideologies as well that becomes a theme in the play if we can kind of zoom in to what you all are sensing there and how that um is informing the work as well and your uh, activism there was a i would say a specific day that we had when we were doing um some of the i would say the the the, the background work the sessions and we were learning where we we, we were uh we were told that zionism did a lot of studying of racism while it was being mm-hmm. formed. And that, to me, and to anybody who, who hears that, it's, it's clear that Zionism is an upgraded version of racism. They took this, the strongest parts that worked and they added things to it that would make it uh, more powerful in regards to what they were trying to do there. Uh, so I, for, for me, I think it's, it's, it's clear and it's evident like um, that they're the same, they're two hands from the same body that are working on two different projects, but for, towards the same goal. And that is to conquer a land and the people and to oppress them and to um, take control over the land and the resources that are there. Thank you, James. Jana, Anissa, would you all like to respond? I completely agree with everything that James said. And I think specifically with, again, these racist ideologies, for instance, that we're seeing within America and then also within Israel, they're inherently violent. If we look at the meanings and the definitions behind Zionism, behind white supremacy, they are exactly the same and they're built upon the exact same thing. And they only succeed with violence of our people of Black people, of Palestinians. Without that, these ideologies, they do not succeed and they do not work. And so I think it's very clear the connections. And like James said, they're working towards the exact same goal. And again, we can see this through violence and state violence of our people, including incarceration, which is a huge thing that affects both of our communities so incredibly deeply and specifically with men in our communities. Thank you, Anissa. Yeah, Jen, would you like to respond? Sure. Um, when you were asking, you know, so this connection between racism and, and Zionism, uh, I understand racism as being this combination of prejudice plus power, right? Mm-hmm. I think a lot of times people think about racism as as personal animus or personal hostility, but really that that the 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 power dynamic um is is um what fuels racism, right? And that's and that's what and that's what white supremacy, right? It's it's about one group, one per people, uh, one group being privileged over another group. And like Anissa said, that's enforced by violence. Mm. So all of the manifestations that we see of racism, of white supremacy, of Zionism, um, whether that's um killings, uh, mass incarceration, um, the death penalty. Uh, here in the U.S., I mean, there, there's so many manifestations. Some of them look the same um, across contexts, and some of them look different across contexts. But they're all enforcing um, this idea of supremacy, this idea of one people being in power, being dominant um, over another. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I agree completely with with James and Anissa, and that would be awesome. my contribution. Yeah, thank you so much. And it's really um, interesting, this this idea that these systems will not work without violence. And yet so many times uh, communities, oppressed communities are the ones who are saying they're the violent ones. They have the rage and they have the violence and they're rioting in the streets. Whereas the systems that places those kind of um, pressures on these communities are only successful through um through approved acts of of violence, which is really interesting. Um, and yeah, James, did you have? Yeah, yeah I, I just wanted to add, I think another tool that allows allows the oppression to exist on top of them being violent is 
and this is this is something that's new within like the last um 100 years is is media and mm-hmm. they're, they're able to they're able to push the notion that we're the ones being violent that we're the mm-hmm. ones um that have violent backgrounds and violent tendencies mm-hmm. because they're able to broadcast that when and then they don't broadcast when they're being violent but i think what's happening now with everything that's happening on tiktok and twitter and instagram that's been taking place um since you know, like October of last year, what's going what's going on in Palestine has really changed and shifted that that dynamic because people can see exactly what's happening in real time, and that and then that goes for um, previous wars that happened uh, before before this one, you know, or before this one was public, you know, like the Iraq War, the Vietnam War, and mm-hmm. all of these different um, um, moments that took place i think that they've been able to just push the narrative that the people whom they are trying to conquer is is violent but that's that's starting to shift yes and that's a really great transition actually this idea of documentation and um we're, we're all you know have our cameras or all on social media and also connecting that to this the practice of docudrama uh, which has many names right docudrama is only one of the names um uh, and as well as documentary and how is that serving as a tool um to combat oppression and to center liberation um and I know James, you already kind of started hinting at that a little bit, but I'm, I'm interested in kind of exploding that a little bit more in these practices. And this is for everyone. This is for the room. Um, I'll continue. I, I think okay. for, for me, it's 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 um, it's allowing everyone who, whether we're all in this, in the states and we are in different states within America outside and then people who are living in different countries who are also being oppressed by the same type of um regimes and arms who are all connected it's allowing us to see that we're not alone and that we if we stand together and if we come together and if we bond together that we actually have the numbers and we have the power and we have the resources to um liberate ourselves and our people uh this is a um, the, the this colonial project that is that we are facing this is something that's been going on for thousands of years and there's many of empires who have tried to do what america is is now doing and that is conquer the world you know so i think that with the documentation of it in real time being able to film and then upload and share it to other people around the world or even just in your city is is a revolution that i don't that they didn't prepare for when they created the internet I don't think that they knew or thought that their oppress their the people that they were oppressing were going to be smart enough to use the internet in the ways in which that we are, and that is causing them to um, to. I, I honestly, I believe, I think that they're they're terrified, and <laughs> you can see it in the ways in which that they've been trying to um, limit in our ways in which that we can use the internet for so for so long. They've been trying to pass laws in congress that will give them control over the internet in ways that will limit how we use it mm. <clears throat> so the, the documentation of of what's been taking place is is crucial great yeah i i yeah i don't think jill scott heron when he wrote the revolution would not be televised dreamed of a world in which right. we had such access to the media um yeah jen i saw you unmute yeah, I just wanted to to build a little bit on on what James was saying, and um, and I think I think truth telling has always been inextricably bound up with liberation, right? And then all of the forces that are trying to prevent us from from telling our truths, um, like James was mentioning, and trying to twist the narrative, control the narrative. I mean, it's it's not accidental. There is a reason why there's been 150 journalists who have been murdered in Gaza mm-hmm. since October seventh. There is a reason why journalists are being specifically targeted, um, and that that is because um, they are out there making sure that we are seeing the truth of of the experiences that are going on. And so claiming um, those of us who are in liberation struggles, claiming our own narratives, owning our narratives and broadcasting those narratives, whether it's through TikTok, which Anissa does some amazing work on TikTok, whether it's um, through social media, whether it's through documentary film, docudrama, plays, um, those those forms of truth telling are all... um, 
that's the foundation of of liberation. And and I and I also believe that in that truth telling, we have to not only be centering, um, revealing and exposing the oppression, but we also have to be centering what our visions of liberation look like. Mm. We have to be thinking about how are we how are we imagining and and centering that imagination of the world we're trying to build, um, as much as we're um, showing exposing the oppressions that we're trying to dismantle. Absolutely. Yeah, Anissa, I would love to hear about your work on TikTok and, um, you know, just this Gen Z approach to truth telling and um, using social media in this way. Yeah, so I think uh, my main, I guess, going into TikTok, the main thing that I was thinking about is it's harder to dehumanize us and normalize our pain and oppression when you are seeing us and when you are hearing about our stories. So something that I do with my social media following and account is I really try to dismantle Zionist lies. And there are so many things that are actively being spread. People are being paid to say horrific things about Palestinians. So with my account, what I try to do is combat that and say, I will point out in a very obviously Zionist propaganda, Israeli-sponsored video, this is exactly why this is wrong. This is not true. And I think with the rise of social media, we are seeing this now on a mass scale and people are able to hear directly from Palestinians. And within my own community growing up, I was one of the only Palestinians. So people really only knew me. But now with social media, people can directly connect to Palestinians on the ground. And something that I also try to make sure that I do is I also share Palestinian joy. So I had the privilege of visiting my grandfather this year, who's a Nakba survivor, has not been able to return back to Palestine in over 50 years. And I shared the joy that him and I have and that he hasn't given up on Palestine. He's in his 80s. He hasn't given up. Mm. We have not given up. They said the old will die. The young will forget. We did not forget. And they have not died. (laughs) So with my social media, I really try to kind of show all things Palestine. And yes, our oppression, what's happening to us, but also the liberation movement that we've started and that we're in and how other groups are now joined in that. And yeah, I just think it's a lot harder to dehumanize us when you are directly seeing us. And also, I try to connect with Palestinians that are in Gaza, that are in the West Bank, that are in Jerusalem, to make sure that I, as someone in the diaspora with a lot of privilege, am representing my people correctly and what's happening to us. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, we are almost um, in, in time to transition to the film. This conversation is amazing and I wish we had more time to kind of dig into it. But I would I would love just as we uh, prepare to transition, um, Anissa, you already kind of started mentioning the joy and like centering both the joy and the resilience uh, and the resistance. And I'm wondering um, where do each of you just maybe in a sentence or so find joy and individual moments of peace while navigating the this immense pain of, of state sponsored erasure and murder, both um, in the States and in Palestine and globally. I find peace and I find joy being in community and being in spaces where um, I personally, where music is being made. That's, mm-hmm. that's where I find my joy, being with my family, being with my people and just realizing and understanding they could do whatever they want to do. They could try to as, for as long as they want. They've been again. They, this is a this has been going on for thousands of years. We can look at so many empires that have existed, and they can't stop the joy. There's nothing that they can do to stop it. At the very most, what they can do is slow it down, but they can't stop our joy. And I think that's what really gets them pissed. <laughs> you know, when they see us, you know, uh, when 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 you see somebody posts something on TikTok and it's a family of, of black people somewhere and they're just in the, at a park barbecuing and it's some random parent is just trying to bother them. It's because they can't stop the joy. They can't. And that, that makes them very upset that we are still here. We're happy. We're smiling. We're raising families and we're doing incredible things in the midst of, of, terribleness that they've been trying to create on this planet you know you can't stop it so the, i think the joy is everywhere and it's easy to find if you're looking for it because uh beauty comes out of oppression amazing thank you um anisa or jan do you want to share one thing for yourselves um for me my joy is palestinian everything that i do every single day i am palestinian first and foremost so celebrating with my family 
continuing cultural practices like Tatris, which is Palestinian embroidery, which they are actively trying to stop us from doing, that they actively try to steal from us, engaging with that, cooking with my aunts who learned from my grandmother who passed away, just engaging and being Palestinian, being with my community, with my friends who are Palestinian, grieving with my family. And that is really just what keeps me going and what inspires me to fight even harder so we can all have liberation. So my young cousins can live in a liberated Palestine that we can return. Amazing. Jen. Um, so I was in Cairo about two months ago and I was there um, uh, checking in on there's a, there's a, a number of Palestinians from Gaza who we've been able to help evacuate, who've been able to help get to safety um, in Egypt. And and one of them is a family of journalists who um, their house had been bombed. It was an intentional targeting. Um, the two parents and the two year old toddler had been trapped under the rubble for hours um, before they were rescued. But then they, they were rescued and eventually we were able to get them to Cairo. And I had never met them in person. Um, and until I went on this trip, and 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 Rafiq is the toddler, uh, so I met them at at, at a mall with a, a coffee shop, and you know, and here was this little toddler, and he had a big like caramel milk, you know, in one hand and his toy car in the other hand, and then you know was playing with his dad's sunglasses and putting them on upside down, and just like being a toddler, being a two-year-old, and the juxtaposition of me knowing that this kid had been trapped under rubble for hours, that the intention had been for this kid to be able. <clears throat> and his parents would be obliterated and not only did they survive but here was this toddler like irrepressibly being a baby and <laughs> playing and laughing and that's not discounting or dismissing the trauma that he went through and the ways right. that will show up in his life um but but the the and and i think like it's it's so much what you were saying james like they 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 couldn't take away his um his joy his mm. his um his precious toddlerness and just witnessing that. And anytime I'm feeling discouraged or, or in too deep or all of those things, I just have to like pull up those photos of Rafiq from that day with like the toy car, the caramel milk and be like, that's right. That's it. That's amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you, James. Thank you, Anissa. Thank you, Jen, for inviting us into your truth, sharing your um, thoughts, ideas, um, and as we transition to the film viewing, um, please be sure everyone to tune in after the film, directly after for session 12, where we will learn more about the continued silencing of Palestine and Hollywood, moderated by Edward Hung. Let us bear witness. Thank you. Thank you, AJ. Thank you. Thank you. Peace. Thank you. This is about our humanity. This is about basic rights that we need. This is about freedom. This is about struggles that touch every part of our lives. Some of the things that I feel passionate about and are reflected in the play is the idea of state sanctioned violence and the resistance that's needed to fight against that. This has allowed me to see that it is possible to have a real intersection of art, struggle, uh, movement, politics, Palestine, Black Lives Matter. His story has just impacted my life and it's gonna to continue to shape my life in organizing. The struggle is real and the fact that I have the privilege to play someone who is no longer with us, who, who fought for his family and for his rights is something that I really wanna show.
In October 2000, the first week in what became the Second Intifada, thousands of Palestinians inside Israel demonstrated, as did Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Israeli police responded with tear gas, rubber-coated bullets, and live ammunition. Over 1,000 unarmed Palestinian citizens of Israel were injured. Twelve of them were killed. This is the most important day in the Middle East. What, laundry day? No, it's the annual talent show. The first annual talent show, the Sidi Peace Center. Oh my God! Asil Asli was the youngest of those killed. Hey, Sidi Peace! Hey, Sidi Peace! Let me see you get up! No way! Let me see you get down! He was a 17-year-old peace activist. We're going to start off with our entrance, and then we'll jump. We're in Pinasco, New Mexico, with a group of activists and organizers. We are working on the play There's a Field. There's a Field is a documentary play about a seal and his family. All of the workshops and games and everything that goes into this process really creates a space that is just so beautiful and open. And it's nothing like I've ever experienced. Yom al art. Yom al art. Yeah, I Yom think you, you in particular, say it and you say it you painfully. <laughs> we get to know about Palestine. We get to know each other. We get to know Asil and his family in a lot of ways. It's like meant to be building. It's meant to be building community. It's meant to be building consciousness. And that becomes clear to me, especially when there's a group of organizers and activists and engaged artists in the room. A seal is setting center stage. This is his grave, but this should not be obvious. Nardine enters. She sits or kneels next to a seal. She strains his hair, adjusts the collar on his shirt. He doesn't respond. What am I supposed to do now? Shit! Nardine pulls a notebook out from her backpack. On the front is written, Peaceful Thoughts, by Asil Asley. She opens it, looks through it, until she finds what she's looking for. I will be asked to choose between what they call protecting and remembering, and what they call forgiving. I will be asked to choose, and I will. Will my choice be the right thing to do, or will it be the wrong thing to do? Closes notebook. Do you know when I feel closest to you? Yo, sister, thanks for the clone. Now my chances of finding a soulmate are 20% higher. If I shave, they'll go up another 13%. If your roommate's still single in four or five years, tell her give me a call. We'll work something out. Love, kick ass to seal, AKA Slider. Let's warm ourselves up a little bit. Simple thing, and then we're going to work some of these sections. I need you water. It wasn't just a play. It was more about telling a story about what happens when, when power is being abused and when voices aren't being heard. And then you say your line. As we were going scene by scene, the story just seemed so familiar. I can't help but get caught up just thinking about it. Yeah, get, get, uh, you know, just. And going through it, sometimes I, I've had to like stop and get up and walk out the room at certain scenes because uh, the intersections are clear. We all deserve a place to be safe. All deserve a place to be happy. All deserve a place to not have to look over our shoulder every minute, every second. And not a place that we have to fight every minute and every second. Hi there, brother. I can't believe you brought your new computer and sent me your old one. I'm coming home to Rade on Wednesday. Choose a movie because I promised Barad that we go as his 10th birthday present. Love you. Miss you. Nardine. Having fun with the PC, eh? Well, it's better than our second bodies, isn't it? At least you're in med school. I'm still in Arabe fighting with logs and acceleration. And I have to keep up with the Alberts and Isaacs crap only because an apple fell from a tree. Exams are just around the corner. I don't know why, but I'm not feeling it. I should be tearing my hair out right now. However, I like my hair. I need it in place. I think when I'm done studying this stuff, 
I'll know what's wrong with your face, and maybe I'll be kind enough to offer you some help fixing it. Shit. You talk too damn much. Just kidding, sis. You can email me anytime you want about anything you want. Okay, I need to go read history now. We'll talk in a few years at my wedding, if I find someone stupid enough, that is. Listen, you're the only person in the universe that I'm telling this about. So if any of this gets out to mom, you'll be dead. Khalid called me and we talked four or five to hours. He said he's been talking to me too much the last few weeks, and he's afraid he's becoming a Nardinaholic. I know, I know, you must be going back right now. Let's be serious. I need your advice. You should be held with your back to the wall in shock. Why haven't you emailed me back these last two days? Give me one good reason and I'll spare your life. Why didn't I email? Physics shit, that's why. I hate these exams so much. About that guy, I don't know. This isn't kindergarten anymore. People aren't nice just because they're nice. Especially when it's that girl boy thing. By the way, I'm thinking of changing my lifestyle. Less computers, less staying up at night, running when I have some free time. Have I got you right? You wanna change the way you live? Do something other than spend your time in front of the PC? Yo, aliens! What did you do with my brother? Cell phone rings. Nardine! <clears throat> Hi, Mom! A seal is in a demonstration here in Arabe. Your father and I are there. We're trying to find him. He's not answering my calls. Can you call, try to talk to him? He'll listen to you. Can you put Dad on for a second? What's going on, Dad? It's quiet. Nothing's going on. I feel the police among some guys. Just tell him to go home. Nardine dials cell phone. A voicemail recording of Asil's voice answers. Hello? Asil, you idiot! Mom is worried sick about you! Get your ass back home! I can't home. hear you so good. Why don't you leave a message? Beep! Voicemail! Fuck you. Mom. The usual, typical, freaking out mom. Of course you don't listen to her. I turn on the radio to see what's going on. Jerusalem police fired verbal bullets and live rounds I didn't have any real knowledge base about the Israeli occupation. And so I think a big part that stuck with me was just the information. The work that we did on context and history in terms of understanding the Asli family's struggle, it definitely impacted and increased my understanding. You have Palestinians telling you what to do when, you know, across the world and on U.S. soil what to do when you get hit by tear gas. Reading the play made it a lot more real to me because um, this is a story that I had to embody and step into the character and role. I was at the bottom of the page. Didn't know that much about what was going on in Israel and with the occupation and the, and the, and the Palestinians at first. I, you know, I, I heard a little bit about it, but I wasn't too connected or too, too, too concerned, to be honest. And then uh, once we got involved, uh, it just kind of opened my eyes to settler colonialism and how connected we all are over the world because of it. Being black in America, you know about the apartheid movement, the struggle to end that. You know, we all love Nelson Mandela, but we never make the connection with what's going on here in America or what's going on in the Middle East. Cell so phone rings. Well, did you call him? I tried, but his phone was off. Leave him a message. But his mobile is off, he won't get it. It doesn't beep or something. Mom, the phone only beeps when it's on. Then send him a text message. Mom, you won't get it. Will you just do it? Okay. Hangs up, writes message. Mom is worried. Go back home. Why did you go to the demonstration? You know that mom and dad are gonna be pissed at you, but whatever. They can't be mad that we have a political consciousness. They gave it to us. Flashback, Hassan is picking fruit in the garden. Jamila is smoking a cigarette and grading papers. Young Nardine and Asil come home from school. Mom, Dad, are we Israeli? What? A kid in my class said we're Arab-Israeli. Sweetheart, listen carefully. You have Palestinian Arab inside Israel. But the kid said I had an Israeli passport. Jamila pulls out a map from the papers that she's been grading. Nardine, can you find our village on this map? Arabe? Nardine does. Now, what are those other names on the map? The villages that got destroyed in 1948? That's right. Do you remember when I took the two of you to one of the destroyed villages? The people who used to live there had to run away to the West Bank and Gaza. 
We are lucky to have stayed in Arabe, and people from the other villages were forced to flee. But we all belong to the same Palestinian nation. Asiyo, what's happening this weekend, on March 30th? Land was taken by force in 1976, so we had the Yom al to protest. Land Day. There's a big march every year since then. We lost six on Land Day, and 100 wounded. Cell phone rings. Ending flashback. It's Siwar. Asil's been taken to the hospital. What? He was shot in the shoulder. Shot? Yeah, but dad told me he's fine now. Where did they take him? What hospital? I don't know. I call all the hospitals in the north. Did the hospital in Tiberias accept a patient with your name? Or Haifa? I call everyone I can think of. Finally, cousin Mustafa answers. He was taken to Naharia Hospital. From the central bus station in Jerusalem, I take a bus to Tel Aviv. From there, I take a train going to Nahriya. I'm planning the moment I'll walk into your hospital room, slap you across the back of the head and say, Stupid! You cost me two days of studying! How on earth could you go to that demonstration, get shot, and make all of us worry? Don't you ever do that again! You had your tonsils out in the hospital. You were three. You had really large tonsils. Flashback. Chocolate or vanilla, Habibi? Mom, can I have some ice cream too? This is for your brother, sweetheart. I want chocolate. Mommy, I want my tonsils taken out too. Azil, Nardine, look what I have for you. Sesame Street plate. I want the Cookie Monster plate. No, that's mine. Mom! Mom! I don't care who gets which plate. Just work it out. You got the Cookie Monster plate in the end. After two minutes, you didn't want it anymore. We fought over Lego parts. I want two windows. But I want a window too. They're my Legos, I get two windows. What are you building? A spaceship. What are you building? Just a house. Is that another spaceship? This one's a palace. Cell phone rings, ending flashback. Nardine, it's cousin Mustafa. Do not go to Naharia Hospital. Your parents already left, police were there, and they didn't let them stay with Asim. Get off the train. Where should I get off? I don't know. For now, just get off. I'll get in a Haifa and take a bus to Carmel for now. This was the exact spot I waited for you when you were in Haifa with two of your classmates. Flashback. Nardine dials cell phone. Where the hell are you, Asil? The last bus to Araba is about to leave. In five minutes, we'll be there. Five minutes. Oh my god, give me a break. Get a life. You're always telling me that. I have a life. You don't have a life. What do you have? Always, always, always. Because I'm in medical school and I don't have time for anything. Will you download that song we just heard? Sis, that song has been on my computer for two years. But I just heard it for the first time. Sis, where are you living? That you hear a song two years after its release? Get a life. So full rings, ending flashback. Nadine, don't go to Carmel. The roads are blocked, and no one can come pick you up. I get off the bus in Kiryat Bialik. Dad is crying. I hear Mom behind him, screaming. What's going on? How's the seal? Look, he was injured pretty bad, but he'll be okay. Then I realize. It just hits me. I just want to ask you something. If you really love me, don't let them take him before I see him. Where would they take him? I told you, he's seriously injured, but he'll, he'll be okay. Say whatever you like. I just ask you. The only thing that's important for me, don't let them take him before I see him. I just need to see you before they take you. Nardine, dial cell phone. Mustafa, can you come pick me up? I'm near Misgav. I'll be there in a half an hour. Remember when we used to swim at the pool in Misgav? Flashback. A seal swimming in the pool, laughing and playing. Hey, Tomer, watch out. Oh, I'll get you for that, Asil. Not if I get you first. Hey, Nardine, come in the pool. How were you able to get along so well? I felt like a stranger there. Did you know that we were left off the transportation list? Transportation from Arabe is not possible. But there's a bus that goes to Arabe. Arabe is not on the list of Misgav. I'm sorry. The rides were for the Jewish kids. I'll take them out of the course, and I'll make sure the checks bounce. In the end, each time we were supposed to swim, they made me call the office every Sunday and Wednesday and remind them to come pick us up. 
I hated to make that call every Sunday and Wednesday. I didn't continue swimming. I stopped because in Jewish society, it's as if our history doesn't exist, as if we don't exist. I can't tell you how many times I met someone from Carmel, 10 minutes away from us, and they say, oh, you're an exception. I don't think you pay much attention to that. But when I was a teenager, every time someone told me I'm an exception, I thought to myself, oh, I'm special. I'm the only Arab who can talk perfect Hebrew and English. I'm the only Palestinian who's liberal and open-minded. It felt good to be an exception. Mustafa arrived. He's injured, very seriously. Mustafa, give me a break, he's dead. No, no, the situation is difficult, but- Mustafa, spare me! He's, he, he's not dead, he's just seriously injured. We'll be home in 15 minutes and I'll know the truth. We get home. I get out of the car. I don't even look back to tell Mustafa, I told you so. Nardine. They, they killed your best friend. Because we live in America, a world full of white privilege, and as black people in the hood, these things happen, the cameras come, and then when everything dies down, they go, you know? So we live in our bubble where we really, truly feel sometimes that we're alone in our struggles, you know? And then you read this play about a 17-year-old kid halfway across the world that's gone through the exact same thing, a family that's gone through the exact same thing that Trayvon Martin's family is going through, that Michael Brown's family is going through. And it's like, wow, like just, wow, this is a 17-year-old kid getting killed by, again, people who are paid to supposedly protect you and keep order and all this other BS. One of my little brothers, he was a victim of being shot in a post nightclub in Orlando. Uh, he was shot maybe three times in one in his leg and twice in his other leg. Uh, so it really, that hit home with me the first time. Just the gun violence alone. This time it didn't, it didn't hit me as hard. It felt more like um, an episode of The Fresh Prince that I've seen a few times already. It, it was just like, okay, it hit me hard. Cause and it's like, now we're being desensitized to this. I find Siwad inside the house. When Siwad was two, she had this big curly hair. I don't know what she did to piss you off, but you put this battery operated car on her head and you drove it back and forth, back and forth till it stuck in her hair. A Sue's classmate showed up late in the morning. I was surprised to see him. He hadn't visited in a long time. I woke Asila. Asila was Nardine's friend. But Ah uh, is in your room. He's just sitting on your bed, crying very quietly. We were playing Mortal Kombat together yesterday to see who would break the record. When he left this morning, I asked him to give me a game for the computer. Nardine's friend is I dead. I didn't know where they were going. I didn't bother to- This headache! Somebody gives me something. I don't remember who. I don't know what kind of pills. I take the pills and try to sleep. There are so many people in the house, aunts and uncles. We sleep in the living room, putting mattresses on the floor. Dad sleeps outside on the porch, if he sleeps at all. I didn't take him out of the demonstration. I didn't take him home. I was just a few meters away from him and I couldn't do anything. I've never seen Dad like this before. Oh my God. What if dad falls apart? Who's going to protect me then? Dad is the strongest person I know. Flashback. Hey, Nardine. Tom and Jerry is on. Nardine joined the seal, laughing over Tom and Jerry. Why do you spend your whole day in front of the TV watching cartoons? When I was in prison, I read thousands of books. I would wake up at six in the morning and work. Do some sports. Discipline. Prison taught me discipline. Am I I never have known what dad experienced in prison if you hadn't started asking him once we got older. The hardest part was the first few months. The worst was a period of interrogation when I was in the hands of the Shabak, the security agency. They had many tools to torture us, punching, beating with sticks, tying my arms to the chair with the interrogator sitting on the table, pushing with his foot into in intimate places, the electric hat, very painful shock. 
How did you stay strong? I don't know. I was 18 years old, a strong boy. And I said, let them do anything they want. I will not break. Five years and two months in prison. Why didn't you ever tell us this before? I didn't want to plant hate inside of you. But aren't you angry at them? Be proud as Palestinians. Be proud as human beings. Freedom of one group never comes at the, at the expense of another's freedom. I miss the mornings Dad walked with us through Arabi. I spent my childhood in this village, playing marbles, setting traps for birds. I worked the land with my father. In those days, you could not leave the village without permission from the Israeli military administration. You see those farmlands over there? Agricultural subsidies were given to help the Jewish farms and destroy the Arab ones. In order to work their fields, you had to change your name to a Jewish name. I was called Yafet. Nadine, Asil, always remember. Hassan scoops up a handful of soil and places it into their hands. You are the roots of this land. You are the trees, the stones, the soil. Dad's love for us, it's like that Khalil Gibran poem he read us. Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life. Every father loves his son. Every father loves his daughter. But the highest level of love towards your children is that they naturally always want to go to the park or to the library. And we walk to the park just about without fail. I think of Tamir Rice, the, the little kid that was shot down in the park by the police. Uh, those things, and, and I, I can't really uh, explain it, but yeah, to just lose a child is just, just this, this whole play, and, and to just play Hassan and have to embody that, that, that loss is, is difficult. The sounds of birds wake me up. It's early in the morning. I have this strange feeling of nothing being the same. Then I remember that you're dead. I hear the birds. Shut the fuck up! I go to your closet. I take out one of your Seeds of Peace t-shirts and put it on. I want to be close to you. Flashback. I was accepted to Seeds of Peace! What's Seeds of Peace? It's an Arab-Israeli coexistence camp in America. I'm going to the U.S. Good for you! Hi, Nardine. Camp is great. The bunks, the counselors, the kids, the food. Today it rained, so we really didn't do much. But we're having fun otherwise. So how's that? Mom, you, are you okay? Did you clean the house yet? Or are you waiting for me? Tell mom not to worry if I don't call. And they're taking great care of us over here. By the way, Found out that I'm great at baseball. The best around, except for the Americans. Well, Americans, you know, baseball's in their blood. Seeds of Peace sounded like one of those programs with Palestinians and Jews together and singing that doesn't touch the root of the problem. But I saw how it had become the center of your life. Sitting in front of your computer after camp, contacting everyone, making plans with them. I didn't want to ruin your excitement by criticizing it. So good. You look much better now. Thank much you. Much better. Okay. okay. You can put the pants on. Great, yeah. <laughs> Hope my mom doesn't see this. And when you got invited back to camp, I actually loved hearing how happy you sounded in your emails home. Play the prank on the neighboring bunk. It was me, Adham, and Roy. Guys, you're older now. It's your second year. We brought you back to camp to be a leader for everyone. You're supposed to set the example. Look at us, Ned. We're an Israeli Jew, a Palestinian from the West Bank, and a Palestinian citizen of Israel. And we're all working together to screw over the next bump. Isn't that what Caesar Peace is all about? You told me about how you guided the younger campers. You had a gift. I feel so confused. As a Palestinian girl living in Israel, on the one hand, I am a part of Israeli society and I carry an Israeli passport, but on the other hand, I have a really strong connection to Palestinians. I'm caught between worlds. You're between worlds, Drew. 
But I don't agree that you're caught. That sounds like these two worlds are leading you. I can never take the word Israeli off my passport, or the word Arab, which I'm proud of every time I hear it. We don't have to be caught. We can lead these two worlds. Rumi wrote, I'll beyond idea, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. Someday, you'll be able to lead both sides to where IDs, passports, and checkpoints aren't needed. And I'm going to meet you there. Don't bring anything, because you won't need it. I told you all the time that I thought you were naive. I just wish I had also told you how proud I am of you, of everything you stood for. Flashback and... I sent Mustafa to the hospital to get the papers signed so they release Asil's body. Dad, they're going to bring him here, right? Yes, they will bring him here. You promised me. I need to see him. They are going to bring him here, I promise. As you are aware, 18-year-old Alain Nassar was also martyred in Adama. How would you feel about having a seal being buried in the Nassar family's cemetery? Two martyrs buried right beside each other. I want my son to be buried in the same grave that my father was buried in. But think about how meaningful it would be if we buried both of the martyrs together. No! No, 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 no. A seal is a martyr of the entire Palestinian nation. True, but he is our son, and he is Nadine and Zawar and Baraz's brother. There can be a joint ceremony, but a seal will be buried in our family cemetery. Someone takes Bara to the neighbor's house, and then they bring you in an ambulance. They immediately put you in my room. They need to prepare you to wrap you in white cloth. We're waiting and waiting. They take you to the living room in that box and they put you there. There are maybe 300 people in the house. Fuck! What is everyone doing here? Leave us alone! Give the family a chance to give him a last kiss. Everyone is crying and screaming and I don't know what and I don't get the chance to be alone with you. They start putting your coffin on their shoulders and they're taking you to the funeral. Dad, come on, hurry up, they're getting away. I keep thinking about the pillow they put under your head from mom and dad's bedroom. The pillow is sticking out. If only you could see the crowd, thousands of people, 12 Palestinian citizens of Israel killed. This is something that shook the country. And two of those 12 killed in Arabe, the funeral processions meet in one big square, and they put both of your coffins there, one beside the other. There is no God but Allah, and the martyrs are beloved by God. We sacrifice our souls and blood for you. Oh, martyrs, a seal and Allah, oh, martyrs, rest in peace, and we shall continue the struggle. Dad and I stand beside you. I put my hands on your face. Your face is cold. There's blood on your nose and clotted between both your eyelids. Your eyes are swollen. You aren't shaved. Flies are coming all the time and I'm trying to keep them away from your face. I, I love, love you. you. You know I love, I love you. As if me and you are talking. When they take you to the cemetery after the ceremony, there's a big hole in the ground. They read from the Quran and take you out of the box. I have a silver necklace of the Palestinian man. Dad, you should have this with him. In Islam, men are not supposed to wear gold. It's not gold, it's silver. Let her give him the necklace. Put it here by his head. They put you in the hole, bring a bag, and pour something over you. What is that? Your grandfather's ashes. This is the grave where grandfather was buried. They had removed his bones and ashes. They cover you with parts of porcelain, and then they put grandfather on top. The next day, dad brings me to the spot where you were killed. I want you to know exactly what happened for when you talk to the press. A seal was sitting under this olive tree. I recognized him from his green seas of peace shirt. The police ran full speed in his direction. A seal fled towards the olive grove. I saw three policemen reach him. They hit his back with their rifle butts. He stumbled.
took a few steps and collapsed. Couldn't see his body because the other trees were in the way. I heard shots. Your mother called out, a seal, a seal. The policeman came out from behind the other trees and shouted at the demonstrators. You can come get him now. The police left him on the ground and blocked the ambulance from coming. I want to sit alone under the olive tree where you were shot. But people are scanning the area, collecting bullets and gas bomb containers and everything. Your blood is slow on the ground. I collect all the stones with your blood on them. A friend of yours asks me for one. Maybe it's selfish, but I keep them all. When I go outside, I do have this target on my back and I can't do this and I can't do that and I can't act this certain way because this will happen. That could have been me. That could have been me on the ground. That could have been me under that olive tree. That could have been me. I never knew that it happened other places. I always thought it was just here. It was just us. I don't know what to do about mom. She's practically falling apart. Unconscious at times or screaming out loud. She needs to take a bath. I practically drag her into the bathroom. I saw the ones who murdered her. I saw them. Believe me. Come on, Mom. Lift your arms up. There you go. Nardine starts to wash them out. Mom, you have bruises on your thighs. You have to stop hitting yourself. They love Azia. So many people love Azia. See, Nardine? How many people came here? People love him. See how many people came for him? Okay, mom, yes. They love us. They love him. People are here for us. We just need to be cleaned up. We just need to be taken care of. I hope he didn't know that they shot him. Did he know he was shot? When your classmates come to the house, Bara asks them all about you. Like he's trying to collect everything they say, trying to hold the images in his mind. Why do you take me to the neighbor's house before the funeral? You think I'm not old enough? I can see my brother dead. I want to see him. Why didn't you let me see him? It's your fault. I didn't know you were at the neighbor's house. I didn't know where you were. There were hundreds of people in the house, Barack. I wasn't in control of what happened. Your friends from Seeds of Peace come. My first day at camp, the seal overheard me complaining that there wasn't any chocolate. Later that day, he, he pulled me out of my bunk and handed me some M&Ms. I never knew how he got You were with a seal at that camp in the U.S. And look at what happened to him. What piece is that? What happened that he was shot? He was chased, beaten, and executed at close range in his neck. He was buried in his Seeds of Peace shirt. They buried the peace. They buried it all. But what security risk could have still been to Israel? That he had to be shot dead? He couldn't hurt a fly. How can you look at the face of peace and in its neck? Maybe you should ask your police forces those questions. We will. I will. Nardine, there's a meeting of European ambassadors in Tel Aviv, and they want our family to present our case. Can you go? I don't want to leave the house. But you speak English better than anyone in the family. Yeah, yeah, okay. A journalist from the Jerusalem Post is here. She wants to interview you. Something will have to change. Siwat plays your music on and on from the PC in your bedroom. I want to transfer to Asil's high school. Why? It's the middle of the term. Asil and I fought a lot. Maybe this will make up for the fact that we were close. So why? If you transfer, at some point, that halo of being a seal sister will fade away. And you'll feel lonely there. You and all his friends carry all these memories of him and I carry almost nothing! Farah, what are you watching? A videotape of the funeral. There's a close-up of a seal's face and body. Sweetie, that may not be. Let him watch it. Nardine. Doesn't the new term at the Hebrew University start in a few days? 
I don't want to go back to Jerusalem. You know the values the seal stood for. You can't throw your hands up in the air and say, that's it, I quit. Dad takes me to Haifa to catch a bus to West Jerusalem. I'm filled with dread. Where are you from? From Arabe. Where? Arabe. It's an Arab village in the north, close to Carmiel. Oh, you are an Arab. Yeah. Then you must be Christian. Why? I don't know. I mean, you don't look Arab. What the fuck does an Arab look like? No, 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 no. I mean, what I mean is, you talk such good Hebrew. Uh, uh, you, you dress like any other Jewish girl. And you don't even wear a scarf. And you look very liberal and very strong and very... So, an Arab Muslim girl in this country can't be those things? Well, you're an exception. An exception? Give me a break. Classes start the next day. I take a deep breath, enter the lecture hall, and sit next to a classmate. We got into it immediately. They were blocking the roads. They were burning tires. They were endangering the police's lives. How dare you justify the murder of my brother? I expect you to stand by me. I change my seat. I delete his number from my phone. Two Israeli kids are killed in a cave near the settlement to Koa. I'm in the supermarket in West Jerusalem with a Palestinian guy I know. We're shopping and talking. Somebody hits me with a cart. I turn around. She's staring into my face. Aren't you supposed to say something? Something like sorry? Sorry? I'm not going to apologize to you. You're a murderer. You're just like the rest of them. You belong in Janine. She wants me to apologize to you. What are you talking about? You belong back in Gaza. You murdered those two kids! Lady, what are you talking about? You belong back in Gaza, you murderer! You don't belong here! You don't deserve to be here! What the hell do you want from me? Fuck! My brother was killed and your police did that a few months ago! And you're screaming at me?! Go the fuck Come back! on, lady! Shut up! Oh, you're standing by her now? You forgot you're Jewish? You're gonna give them the lamp? She's a murderer! You're defending her now? She just turns around and goes out. I call mom and dad. Have a petition signed. Call the Arab Knesset members. Call S.B. Bishara. Dad, what are you talking about? Call somebody, come on. You have to do something. You can't just give up. I just need you to tell me that everything's going to be OK. Please. We owe it to a seal. It's easier for mom and dad to fight. They're living in the village, surrounded by Palestinians, relatives, people who knew you. I'm back in the Jewish society, and I have to deal with people who don't know what I went through and don't want to know. I have to live in that society. I have to listen to people talking Hebrew all the time and go to university with reserve duty soldiers. But I know you'd want me to keep trying, and I don't want to let you down. I go home every weekend to be with the family. Dad spends hours sitting alone in the garden. Life has no meaning with the seal gone. Even if I lived in the Garden of Eden, it is as if everything is, is dead. I, I, don't, I don't feel anything. I don't get joy from anything I do. I do my responsibility because I owe it to a seal and the other martyrs. Barat is interested in everything you liked, like he's searching for you. I try to get the meaning of the song the seal of life, to understand why he liked the song, why he liked that singer. I think if he were here, he would be happy about how it turned out to be. Yeah, he would be, bro. See, what won't open up to me, but that's nothing new. Remember how we used to tease her? Shut up! I do not! Yes, you do. That's I, where you come from. I do not come from a party called Fuck You All. At least mom is cooking again. She gets the laundry done sometimes. She usually manages to take Bara to soccer practice. But she's become like a battle machine, shooting in every direction. A policeman parks in front of dad's shop one day. What is your car doing in front of our shop? Move your fucking car! The police go to the principal of the school where she teaches. Look, I think you owe it to her to listen to me because she has a lot to lose. 
We don't have anything to lose. She thinks we won't dare arrest her. We could, and we can do it in the middle of the night when there's nobody there to protect her or to demonstrate. She should know we're not weak. She's planning on going on pension next year, right? If she gets fired, she won't get a pension. She still has other children, right? Her daughter is a student in university. It's not just her life that's on the line. I owe. Mom, we can't pick fights with policemen. It breaks my heart each time I see soldiers or the police. But this is an Israeli state, whether we want it or not. You have to be wise. What are you doing in a seal's closet? Nothing. Just reading his papers, looking at his clothes, his shirts. Mom, you've been there all day. I take care of everything that's his. But I keep thinking of the future. How will these valuable items be treated? It even crosses my mind to sometimes dig a hole in the backyard, put in all of his things, and cover it with cement so that no one can touch his belongings. More than anything, Mom wants to know that I will go on with the struggle. Don't stop. Keep walking forward. I'm here today, but what if something happens to me tomorrow? There must be someone to take my place. Mom, just because I'm not living my grief the way you're living yours, and remembering a seal the way you are, doesn't mean I care any less about his memory. I will die with pain if we are negligent in a seal's case. The whole world treats this as if it is a page that they folded. Where are you going? I have to study for an exam tomorrow. The demonstration begins in half an hour. But mom, this exam is important. More important than your brother? Siwar, Bara, and I join mom and dad at all the demonstrations. The families of the martyrs choose dad to represent them as a group. Their passion seems rekindled. We won't give up. We'll go on until justice is delivered for everyone. The 12 who fell are not merely numbers. Each one had a name. Each one had his own dreams, a home, a future that was terminated. Jamila hands Nardine a stack of flyers and a poster that reads, we won't forget, we won't forgive. Give me some, Mom. I'll pass them out. Good girl. You know what I always say, only women can make a change. I'm holding the signs for your brother. I'm chanting the slogans. I'm still talking to the media, but the interviews begin to make me feel empty. I do the interview, go home, and nothing changes. I am so tired. But mom is the opposite, like she's politically reactivated. The play and the words and the lines are being pushed by the women in the family. It is Nardine, it is Jamila who's feeling the brunt of the pain. You know what I mean? And they're the ones that's expressing the pain. And it is women of color around the world that do feel the brunt of oppression. The women are always the ones who stand up and stand on the front lines. Um, and, and are the ones who, quite frankly, are most effective. And the question is, is right, am I willing, right, to join in that solidarity and release my ego, release the toxic masculinity that's been to some degree ingrained? We mothers of the martyrs need to have a joint front. If we want to change, then we have to be that change. When all the doors are closed in my face and I'm bearing mountains on my shoulders, I also feel water running through my chest. This water has to dig its way through. She sounds almost like you used to, about making change. This planet has gone mad. It's gonna blow up. Pain and sorrow? We are their hope. The planet needs us more than ever. You should save all your energy you're putting into seeds of peace into the bigger and more difficult struggle. Defending the rights of Palestinians. This is where we, the little people, can be effective. We are the ones who can make peace. Peace between people, not the leaders. A Jewish Israeli spends his His very sad thing, but then goes back home and does nothing. The Jewish community is not ready for that kind of change. 
they could maybe acknowledge that there's some kind of discrimination, but there's very, very few Jewish Israeli who acknowledge that their country was built on the ruins of our nation. Do you really believe you could reach those people? Part of me is like, well, I think I'm wasting a lot of time talking to this one person. Maybe it's like my neighbor, maybe it's a classmate talking to this one person, trying to see their own white privilege and what they're doing is hurting me. And even if I get that person to realize, oh, they have privilege, maybe they won't even do anything about it. And even if they do something about it, what is that going to do? with my state in the United States, they, the police are still gonna, you know, you know, brutalize my people, you know? So when I think about how should I spend my energy, should I focus on interpersonal relationships? Should I focus on the systemic issues? I actually, I knew a SEAL. I had been his counselor, Israeli and Palestinian youth. But um, as time went on, I really began to think about Seeds of Peace as, um, and organizations like that as being quite problematic. Organizations like Seeds of Peace, um, the very idea behind them is predicated on the notion that hatred is the root cause of the, uh, the conflict, and that if only the hatred could be addressed, then uh, the conflict could be solved. But hatred is not the root cause uh, of the situation in, uh, in Palestine. Israeli colonization is um, occupation, uh, structures that are imbalanced of power and privilege. And so these humanizing programs that don't directly address uh, the structural injustice, they actually only serve to reinforce that injustice. Um, and, and it was through my understanding about that in Palestine that that really informed my understanding of racial justice work here in the United States. That essay you wrote to your Seeds of Peace friends, the one you wrote on the anniversary of the 1976 Land Day killings, I find it and I print it out. You called it Peaceful Thoughts. Nothing but memories from that sad day when a group of Israeli soldiers tried to kick the local citizens out of the village. What village was that? It was my village, Arabe. As Land Day has come like every other year, I should fulfill my duty as an Arab and bring those memories to life. We should never forget, but we should forgive. I know that's what you believed. I want to be able to do that. I begin working in a hospital. The staff there seem really nice. There's a nurse named Yael. It feels like we're becoming friends. We're scheduled to work together on Israel's Independence Day. Okay, if we have to work on Independence Day, let's at least have a barbecue. Yeah, I don't celebrate Independence Day. What difference does it make? It's an opportunity for us Israelis to celebrate something. Yeah, I'm not an Israeli. What? Israel defines itself as a Jewish state. I'm Palestinian. I'm not Jewish. Well, if you define yourself as Palestinian, then why don't you move to the West Bank? I don't have to leave. The Israeli state came and built itself over my land. I didn't move to Israel. Israel moved to me. But this is the only home that the Jews have. It's my home too. I have rights. Yeah, I am. I just never knew you thought about it that way. But what about the suicide bombers? It's impossible to work like this. I have to stop getting into political arguments into any kind of discussion about the situation, nothing. The minute I walk inside the hospital, I've got to switch off all my anger and frustration and not touch it. Believe me, it will turn back on the minute I walk out. At least, I'll be happy with my life inside the hospital. I'll go there, do my job, people will love me. I'll love them. Maybe if I meet them outside the hospital, I wouldn't love them as much. I'm sorry, a seal, but I can't tell people in the hospital about you. Because if I do, politics will come between us and ruin my working relationships. Let's please get to the point that you shot live fire. The campaign that Dad and the other families lead has an impact. The police who ran after you will be put on the stand. The truth about your murder will have to be told. Shimoni was shouting from the grove that someone is injured. 
I crossed the road and looked down into the grove. I saw Shimoni and I saw a guy lying there. And were you interested in how that could have happened? At that moment, I couldn't try to find out. The riot was still taking place. I'm asking you this because you wrote a report the next day. This report doesn't even discuss the incident. Why? I wrote that report after midnight about certain points that I found important enough to write down. Mr. High. I didn't write that down. I didn't write that down. Mr. High, can I please know why? You wrote it on October 3rd. By then, there must have been rumors about people being killed. True. And you could have imagined that just maybe, not for sure, but maybe he could have been one of the people killed. What could be more important than reporting about circumstances, facts, and testimonies of the police right after a young man was killed? Maybe it slipped my memory. Look at a seal's picture! Who you killed! Anyone who makes this sound will be sent out in- Mom, sit down! Don't look at him! Look! Jamila calling out is led away by guards. Matan takes the stand. Tell us what happened. There were a big group of people in the Olive Grove. They were coming our direction. As we ran towards them, I saw a youth in the olive grove. He stumbled, tried to get up again, and run, then fell down. We ran to the youth. Shimoni got there first. I saw him lying on the ground, face down, with a blood stain on the back of his shoulder. Shimoni lifted him up so we could see his face, and I understood he's injured by the look in his eyes, that he's unconscious. Can you attempt to explain what happened? How did the youth get shot? Really don't know. Now, in the report, you refer to the youth, and you were satisfied by only one sentence. We were attacked by a crowd through the olive grove. I noticed someone lying on the ground. Yes, but now I've explained that before, that I saw him run and fall. Why didn't you mention it in the report? Out of brevity? Could be. You say the youth was running. Right. Tripped as you were chasing, intending to arrest him? Right. As he tripped, he tried getting up, and afterwards I understand that you saw him on the ground, bleeding? Right. When was the moment he was shot? He drew back a few meters, and apparently when he tripped, that was the moment he was shot. Physically, I really don't know. You don't know how he was shot? You don't know anything? I say this in extreme honesty. I was shocked when I saw it. I looked in his eyes. They were always following me. This shouldn't have happened. It didn't have to happen. A reporter is waiting for us outside the courtroom. What was the seal doing at that demonstration in the first place? You say he was a peace activist? How do you explain that he was taking part in a riot? Are you suggesting that murdering my son was justifiable because he was at a demonstration? How can you- I'll deal with the reporter, Mom. You go with that. What was a SEAL doing at that demonstration? You were a teenager and a peace activist. That's why your case got some attention. Why Israelis questioned your murder even a little bit. But then it's always back to, but what was he doing there? If he was there, he must have been violent. And the other martyrs, no one even questions their murders. I love you, brother, but you're not better than the others who were killed. They're trying to villainize him and criminalize him. Like, what was he doing there? Why was he protesting? He was putting the police lives in danger. It's like, what? The police have guns. He has nothing. He has his voice. You know what I mean? But apparently it's the police lives that were in danger. You know, and protesters who are trying to protest police brutality. We're just made to look like the villains, even though it is the state, the government of Israel, or the government of America, or whatever world power that may be that's really just terrorizing us. We will see at the protest tomorrow. I'm not sure. What do you mean? I hate this. And what good does it do? No matter how many confrontations mom gets into, no matter how many interviews I go do, how many marches I attend, how many hours of frustrating testimony I sit through, who and what am I changing? I can't change the whole people's racism. Regardless of whether or not you change their racism, regardless of your frustration, we have to fight for our humanity, for our future. Growing up Arab in the United States or Palestinian in the United States, 
you know, there's like airport checks. <laughs> you think your phone has been tapped. Do you worry that you're on lists? But, um, but it's, n I don't feel the same reality that I think a lot of um, black and brown Americans feel just walking down the street. And so understanding and relating to the fear in this play and the vulnerability to the state and the police and the lack of accountability there is something really powerful about being able to share our stories and look at someone in the eye um, and know that they know where that pain comes from. Nardine opens the notebook. It's been a decade since land day. What can I say for a mother who's lost her son? Or a sister who's lost a brother? I stand worthless to bring them back, but powerful enough to bring back their memories. We should never forget, but we should forgive. We can't start forgiving before we see the smallest step towards acknowledging the crimes that were done to the nation in general, and your murder in specific. In a few years, my seed's friends will become soldiers. They will go to the army to protect their families. But will they stay the same? What will happen if they become like those soldiers who try to kick us out on land day? A handful of your Jewish Israeli friends from Seeds of Peace are turned upside down by what happened to you. The ones who were there with us through the process of your death in the investigation. A few even refused to go to the army. But what about the hundreds of Jewish Israeli seeds of peace who promote dialogue with Palestinians and then fight in the West Bank or Gaza? What kind of impact did you have on them? Rumi once said, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. There is no field of wrongdoing and rightdoing with something in the middle beyond that. There's a definition of right and a definition of wrong. There's been so many times that I've wondered um, what a seal would say about Seeds of Peace now if, if his own political political ideas and, and political analysis had been able to evolve as opposed to being essentially frozen at the age of 17. We could determine that police fire caused a fatal injury to a seal. We can also determine that there was no justification for the police to fire at him. He did not represent any danger to them. However, we cannot point to any particular officer as the one who fired the shot. It's possible that an additional investigation on the part of the Police Investigations Department will yield results that we did not achieve. An internal police investigation? As if the police would actually investigate itself. There is justice, and there is justice for Arabs. I need to call the mothers of the other martyrs. We need to make some kind of joint response. Shortly after Michael Brown's death, after the failed attempt to indict the officer that, that killed him, I had a very similar feeling. It's just this like total loss of hope. You have hope up until that moment. It's like, okay, this was, this was done, it was wrong. We can't fix it. Nothing we do is gonna bring Michael Brown back. Nothing we is like an open wound. A group of Israeli seeds, your friends, protest. They send letters to Judge Orr. We are stunned by your decisions not to recommend indicting any of the police officers involved in the October 2000 killings. Your Honor, if the victims were Jewish, you would be sure to bring those responsible to account. In fact, you would not even face such a dilemma. In instances in which Jews demonstrate, even violently, no police officers have fired weapons and no demonstrators were killed. But these were Arabs, and therefore they were automatically not protesters, but rioters. And the police confronted them, not simply with clubs, but with rifles. This was not a Jewish teenager, but a seal, a sled, whose contagious smile you never knew, sir. Therefore, rather than face trial or indictment, his killers remain free and in uniform to defend our country. Our country, which with your decision, has disowned Palestinian citizens. Dear friends of a seal, of mine, of ours, in these difficult days, there's nothing more comforting and calming than to see you demonstrating for a seal and for justice. I am not good with words, so I'll keep it short and just say I am proud of you. I'm proud to be your friend, and I'm proud to be on your side in this struggle. You have friends fighting for you, brother. But still, the police do nothing for another whole year. Then they call Shimoni, the first person who reached you, to take a polygraph. He doesn't come. 
The police investigations department don't force him to cooperate. They don't investigate anything. And then they really cross the line. They want an autopsy. They want to dig up your body years after you were buried and cut you apart. The police then claim that the investigation isn't progressing because we won't cooperate with the autopsy. The attorney general closes the case. No officers face charges. We did everything we possibly could with SEAL, but we didn't succeed. There was no way to succeed. So we're here to- I worked on this case that we were organizing around upstate that was a man named Sam Harrell who had been killed in, in a correctional facility there by a, a gang of, of guards. Um, and we'd been doing the protests around and working with his uh, sister and, and wife. It, they had been so close to getting justice. And then 17 affidavits later from you know, other people who had seen it happen, the judge decided there wasn't enough evidence. I believe! I believe! I believe that we The state is not interested in finding justice for communities that they don't deem important. If we can't find justice here, we'll go to the international court. International court? Mom! We owe it to a SEAL to continue this battle. You are a part of a SEAL, and you are a part of the whole Palestinian nation. Nardine sits where she sat when she first entered and opens the notebook. I will be asked to choose between what they call protecting and remembering, and between what they call forgiving. I will be asked to choose, and I will. Will my choice be the right thing to do, or the wrong thing to do? Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there's a field. I will be there, and I will see you when you get there. If there was anything that I could say to a SEAL, um, first off, I would want to say thank you. Um, thank you for fighting. Thank you for standing up. Thank you for saying, you know what, this is enough and I'm not going to take it anymore. Um, thank you for understanding that you are powerful, understanding that you are, are strong, understanding the sense of community, and understanding that it's not just going to be you who, who wins this. This struggle is not allowing me to live a normal life. I just want to remember you how I want to remember you. Personal, at home. If I keep fighting, I'll be stuck with sadness, hatred, disappointment. I will never be good at my job. I'll be miserable. I'll bring miserable kids into this world. I go to very few demonstrations now. I even avoid watching the news. Forgive me, my brother, but I can't do it anymore. I don't have the power to fight. I want to finish my residency, open a clinic, to have a husband who loves me. We'll take care of each other. We'll have a nice house. We'll raise children together. I hope my children will have enough strength to fight. Not to live the struggle, but on the personal level. Whenever they come up against discrimination, I want them to stand up for themselves, believe in themselves, not to give up and say, fuck it, I'm moving to Denmark. The fact that I stayed here, me, staying here, choosing to raise children here, it's not a very active form of resistance. But just by staying, it means that I deemed myself to struggle every single day of my life. I felt a lot of resentment at the end of the play where she says that she is just going to live here and be here, or be there, you know, raise her children there and resist in a personal way. Um, and so revisiting the play this time, I feel like I relate to her much more because I feel like I relate to that feeling of just wanting to exist and struggle in your exist. You know what I mean? Just like personal struggle. Um, and wanting those things of, you know, a family and security and not always um, grappling with life and death. Confronting, like, head on the targets that are causing the oppression is sort of my natural go-to. So I have a lot of back and forth with the role of Nardine, which I think is helpful in me identifying sort of what my role is as an organizer, but also what are my sacrifices? People could pick up everything and go and just be done with it. 
but to have love, to have compassion, to dream, to imagine that it could be better, I think is worth digging deeper and figuring out how we can actually stay and, and change our communities in a way that's sustainable and in a way that's real and in a way that's equitable. I'm a proud father. I have a five-year-old beautiful son, baby boy, but he's a black boy. And um, I personally am absolutely addicted to the news and what's going on. And I'm con every time uh, someone is killed by the police, I damn near get an alert on my phone. Or my son's mom, she can't deal with it. She refuses to watch the TV sometimes. It just hurts her to the core whenever something like this happens. And a, a glance at the television set will bring her to tears. And she's like, she's a med student, seven-year seven med school. She's about to be a great doctor, and that's all she wants to focus on, you know, being a good mom to our son and focusing on her career. And it's a beautiful thing. And I see that in Nardine's struggle. She just wants to focus on her schooling and, and you know, raise her family. But at the same time, she, she keeps being confronted by all these elements in society, you know, at the supermarket or whatnot, or, or her classmates or... It's so many things that saying, no, you cannot just live your life. The struggle is happening and you, there is no escape from it. Having a group of black organizers and activists and artists come together in the United States who are, are already a part of the resistance and already a part of movements here, connecting with the stories and lives of people in Palestine and their movements and their history is a part of building a larger movement in a larger trajectory toward global resistance. I don't think we're going to win alone, and I, I think it's really important um, to, to know who, who's in struggle with you. I'm hoping that I can use this video as a tool to talk to the community members that I organize with. Everyone from New York City, to Arkansas, to Mississippi, to South Carolina, so that they can understand, right? that we are not in a silo by ourselves, and that there are people who are going through these struggles every day, that not only can we learn from them, but that we need to support them so that we are not just creating the movement in our world, but that we're creating a global movement. If I had an opportunity to speak to Nardine present day, I would like to let her know that we are here. We have not forgotten you. We will continue to fight because that's what you deserve. That's what we deserve. That's what our children deserve. I will go on. I will make this planet a better place to live. And I will go on. For all the souls who only saw pain and sorrow, I promise you, I will go on. Until we meet in the field, my friend, take care. My, My brother, brother, take, take care, care in the field. A seal is sitting back where he was at the beginning of the play. Nardine, as in the beginning, strains the collar of his shirt, smooths his hair. She kisses him on the top of his head, and she exits. End of play. <laughs>